in one of Richard Dawkins' um, lectures available on YouTube, he talks about the, um, the, the material substance that our bodies are made of, and he, he, he cites the um, apparently robust statistic that every glass of water we drink must contain at least one molecule from, well, one molecule that's passed through the bladder of, uh, of Cromwell, just because of the, the simple statistical fact that there are more glasses of water, more molecules of water in a glass of water than there are glasses of water in all the waters of the world. Therefore, the statistics suggest that it's more than likely that uh, at least one molecule has been through that particular route. And then he goes on to say, of course, that uh, there's nothing particularly special about Cromwell's bladder. Uh, molecules in that glass of water will also have fallen on the heads of dinosaurs, have uh, been drank by sailors on the, uh, uh, on the Mayflower. And, you know, I've had all the various histories that molecules of water could possibly have since those molecules were first forged thousands or millions of years ago. Um, what he doesn't go on to say, but what he's certainly inferred in that, is that uh, there's nothing particularly special about water either. Um, obviously the molecules of the gases that we're breathing in and breathing out all the time have been in a similar circuitous journey through the lungs of various animals and through the transpiration systems of various plants uh, and have contributed toward the combustion of flames left, right and centre. So again, gases have, have also had that journey through people's bodies and through the rest of the world. And not just gases, um, although perhaps less easy to imagine, for me at least, uh, every other kind of molecule must also have been through that kind of journey, albeit possibly a slower passage since there are, and this is again something Dawkins points out in that lecture, since there isn't a single molecule in my body that was around 10 years ago, because the molecules in, my, in human bodies change over that quickly, uh, those molecules that make up my bones and muscles and flesh have gone somewhere, and indeed came from somewhere. Uh, they came from the things that I ate largely which ultimately came from the things that those things ate, either through carnivore activity or through the activity of, uh, uh, of, of nourishment that plants undergo. Uh, so again, within that, there's a, a whole network of uh, flows of molecules and atoms through bodies, through the environment, uh, in and out of bodies, uh, but of course that movement is completely imperceptible to us. Even the movements of, of water and gas, which presumably is relatively quick compared to the movements of some of the other things I've mentioned, is going to be slow and unnoticeable. Come on, Pops, there's a dog in that field. Come on, let's go. Uh, it certainly doesn't feel like that. I guess if you were to find some way of mapping all of the molecules. I'm mapping a certain molecule, let's say, let's say you identify, or an atom, let's say you identified um, calcium atoms, all the calcium atoms in the world. Well, let's say you were managed to uh, put a tracer on those, all those calcium atoms, so that you knew their location in space at any time. And then you made a kind of animated movie of all these locations and sped that movie up. What you would see is, um, a flow, a sort of set of whirlpools and uh, eddies and apparent comings together into, into, the, into the shape of bones and then the drifting apart um, or passing through those kind of um, uh, passing through those shapes and those temporary forms in space momentarily before moving on and similarly with every other um, atom element molecule if you put similar traces on all of those, the same pattern would hold. It would look like ripples in a three-dimensional pool or uh, those kind of standing harmonic waves that you get when you twang a guitar string. 
but as I say, we can't perceive that, even though we are, in that sense, more like fountains than like sculptures. We're not, that's so that that isn't visible to us. Which is a shame, because it's, uh, I think having that kind of a sensibility, having an, uh, an appreciation of oneself as that kind of uh, conduit for all sorts of different flows, kind of manifold for the various flows of the elements and atoms around us would be quite a nice thing to be able to add to the list of possible ways of being that we have. So in that light, I'm just trying to think of uh, thought experiments, I guess, which lend, lend, some, lend themselves to that kind of sensibility. And the one I'm playing with right now is one in which, uh, well, I'll just backtrack a bit. I think one of the, way, one of the reasons why we don't experience like ourselves in that way, and there's good evolutionary reasons for this, is because of our sense of sight and our sense of touch. Our sense of sight seems to give things a kind of permanence and puts boundaries around objects that are in our visual field, uh, observes stabilities. Uh, when I move my head, this tree doesn't move, it stays in the same place because of the visual system that's preserving its, its fixed location in space. Uh, and, you know, and and sight observes those kinds of differences and maintains them as, as salient factors which might aid our survival. So our, certainly our sense of sight contributes towards an understanding of the world which is not of a series of flows and eddies and currents, but is a series of relatively stable objects fixed in an empty background. And that sense of sight is confirmed and complemented and indeed overlapped with our sense of touch. Uh, so that when we do reach out our hands to touch these, uh, these uh, phenomena, we don't experience uh, a kind of coming together of two flows, of two fountains. We experience ourselves as touching something that has hard edges and that has something approaching permanence or... Um, well, just tangibility, really. Uh, and again, that's that sort of sets the sets the tone of the sensibility in which uh, we are surrounded by fixed objects in space, in which the atoms and elements appear to be going nowhere, and we also experience ourselves similarly as objects in space, statues, albeit moving statues, in which the object, in which the atoms and elements are going nowhere, and. Uh, not as fountains, not as convergences or manifolds for the various um, flows of, of substance through the world. But uh, that's not the case with other senses. That seems to be the, that's the, um, the experience that sight and touch undoubtedly produce. But it's not the same with uh, smell, it's not the same with sound. And it's not the same with taste, although taste is a bit more tricky to get along with. Um, a world in which we were only able to hear and were only able to smell, in which there was no touching and there was no seeing, uh, would be very different. No evidence would be presented to us of uh, hard-edged permanence. We would feel uh, odours wafting and mixing through us because with smell it doesn't seem to be, at least I certainly can't experience a distinction between inside and outside. They all just seem to pass through the boundary of the, of the body completely un, in an unmarked way. They don't mark that boundary in their passing. At least I don't certainly don't experience them as doing that. Uh, and similarly sounds, uh, they don't have hard edges. They don't stop prior to the beginning of another sound in, in spatial terms. They form chords, they blend, they rise and fall, they just slowly decay, they re-emerge elsewhere as echoes and resonances and harmonics. Um, so I think uh, if we could just imagine ourselves as kind of standing still, because after all walking is a kind of touching, and um, 
I can still feel the wind on my skin, so I'm feeling that, but it doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like a hard object. And uh, identify myself not with the sights and touches of the world, but with the smells and sounds of the world. Then it seems to me that the world is much more like this uh, flowing delta of experience.